Hi, I'm Pedro da Costa, Director of Communications at the Economic Policy Institute. This is the State of Working America podcast, where we seek to elevate workers' voices to make sure that they're heard in the economic policy debate here in Washington and beyond. First, tell me your name and uh, a little bit about yourself. Okay, uh, name is Sergio Avedian, born actually in Istanbul, Turkey, and then I came here to go to college uh, when I was 17. Finished college, um, got an economics degree from a major Southern California university, went to work on Wall Street. Immediately after that, I was on Wall Street. I was probably the head trader at Prudential Securities for about 18, 19 years, wow. and then quit, retired, whatever you want to call it, then became a PGA certified golf instructor, do that at my spare time as a hobby, you know, still actively trade stocks for myself and a few friends of mine, uh-huh. derivatives and stocks, basically, and um, about three, four years ago, I decided, you know, we were having dinner, and I decided to, uh, you know, start doing right share, because I wanted to actually write a book about how algorithms are pretty much going to be running human life, as we know it, and, uh, but then started driving immediately got myself a couple of mentors who practically taught me everything I know from the get-go, so I had a leg up on most of the drivers. Um, did well. I was averaging close to $40, $50 an hour driving on a relaxed fashion, basically, and then started looking into the into the other side of the issue, which is how these algorithms are practically deciding what the driver does, where they do, where they drive, when they drive, and... Uh, then it became like a obsession of mine to really dig deep and, and um, I eventually became a driver's advocate, actually, uh, because I think what these companies are doing is, are horrible, to be honest with you. But uh, look, I use Uber and Lyft as a passenger myself. It's a great service. It's, it's all good. But uh, at some point, um, things have to change. And I think with AB5 passing now, I think things are changing. So we'll see how it goes. So is it the case where you kind of got in on the ground floor, so to speak, and, and you had uh, you were able to make money while the going was good before they started implementing the kind of algorithms that cut down on people's... No, intake? the algorithms always existed, but uh, uh, to give you a point of reference, when uh, UberX, which is the most used platform uh, in the Uber app, uh, as far as the passenger is concerned, obviously, started in Los Angeles, July 4th of 2012. And uh, at that time, it paid the driver $3.25 a mile. Today, we're nine years later, it pays the driver 60 cents a mile. So a lot of people don't know this, don't don't know the history of where things have gone, right? And, um, you know, the, the flexibility and the freedom argument, it becomes moot when you just cut the prices from 3.25 a mile to 60 60 cents a mile gradually over the last seven years. Yeah. So when I got in was, I would say, was about 2016, early 2016. The price cuts were already uh, were done pretty much. But then when I, when I started driving in 2016, we used to get paid $1.25 a mile. Well, now it's three years later and it's 50% lower. So, yeah, I mean, um, initially, obviously, the marketplace wasn't oversaturated as it is today, and uh, the demand was going through the roof. If I wanted to, basically, I could have 100% utilization rate as far as my driving is concerned. But obviously, driving is physically taxing, so you just kind of take breaks, whatever. But I'm, uh, I got in it when the things were good. Yeah. You know, I call it like I call it. There's three phases of Uber: is the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah. So the good. <laughs> The good was when it first started, the bad was when I started, and now it's ugly. So, so that's where we're at. That's fascinating. So how, did, so how did you veer into advocacy, and how did you become, I mean, I guess you became aware of the, of the price squeeze your, through your own experience. And could you tell me about the differences between Uber and Lyft if you work with both platforms? I work with both platforms. Uh, I started with Uber first, and then... Probably about six months later, I added Lyft because I figured um, pretty quickly that if you're on both platforms, your chances of uh, increasing your earnings are a lot higher. Plus, you have uh, deactivation issues, right? I mean, if a passenger complains about anything, Uber will deactivate you or at least suspend you for 48 hours until they do their own own investigation. And in fact, it happened to me uh, last year. (laughs) I had a, uh, obviously, as you know, 
marijuana is legal in California. Yeah. Um, I had a passenger who I gave a ride to was reeked. I mean, he was reeking of pot. And uh, right after that, I picked up this lady who immediately, when she got him, I mean, I opened my windows, wow. but that pot smell doesn't kind of go away right away. Yeah. And she uh, immediately started becoming abusive and belligerent and started saying, I'm going to report you, you're smoking pot and driving. Well, if you know me and look at me, uh, I'm in my early 50s now. <laughs> I don't think I'm that irresponsible. I, I am aware that there may be some other drivers doing it. So she reported me, and before I, you know, the, I ended the ride early, I said, please get out of my car because I'm not going to handle your abuse this way. And um, she reported me, and, and sure enough, before I could even have a chance to report it to Uber, um, uh, I got an email saying that your account has been suspended. So I'm like, okay, that's cool. Why? And then, well, of course, there is, you know, Uber and Lyft are like LAPD. They should first ask questions later. Of course. So, so 72 hours later, uh, supposedly they did their investigation, and then they put me back on the platform. So I'm on both platforms, going back to your original question, yeah. uh, because certain areas of Los Angeles that I drive in, uh, Lyft is stronger. Demand is higher. Certain areas, Uber is in total control. So having both was one of the ways to increase my earnings, my uh, per app, uh, app on our earnings. And could you talk a little bit, because the research that uh, my colleagues have done is basically focused on the notion of whether or not uh, Uber drivers and Lyft drivers are independent contractors or actual employees of those companies. And uh, and some of the arguments that the, the firms have made is that uh, basically that these are new tech platforms that provide a way for individuals to create their own small business. Could you talk about whether or not you feel like you, you're running your own small business when you're driving Uber and Lyft? Well, absolutely not. I mean, look, we have all called uh, a lot of independent contractors for services that are you know, plumbing may need or, or uh, you know, for any other service, really. And, you know, if I, I mean, to give you an example, if I were to call a plumber and say, well, why don't you just show up? Once you show up, I'll tell you what the job is, and I'm also not going to tell you how much I'm going to pay you. Uh, how many plumbers would show up at your house, <laughs> right? I mean, I, I would say you would get hung up pretty fast, and uh, Uber and Lyft drivers are in the same situation. We show up in front of people's homes close to 10 million times a day. That's how many rides Uber and Lyft do between the two of, two platforms in the U.S. alone. And, um, you know, we just show up in front of people's homes, restaurants, bars, whatever there is, without knowing what the job is and without knowing what we're going to get paid. So when the companies, I read about Tony West's claims the other day on Twitter where he's saying, yeah, we're just a platform. AB5 doesn't even, even apply to us. ABC test doesn't apply to us. Well, um, in fact, there was a case in 2017, which I have the transcript for. An Uber attorney uh, made the same argument in front of a judge, and I have the transcript. I read it. I was laughing about it the other day. Uh, you can't make the, the – you can't just say that the driver is not the core part of our business or our platform. I mean, you know, you could obviously say whatever you want, but I don't think it's going to fly in any courtroom. And if you're going to just, that's your claim, that, that the driver is not an essential part of your business, um, well, we'll see how the courts are going to look at that. As far as independent contractors, I mean, look, if, if, if you tell me where the destination of the passenger is, because... We don't know where the passenger is going until yeah. you get in the car or they get in the car and we start the ride. I, That's a really important point. Yeah, I mean, I could be going to Timbuktu, and there are certain days, you know, if I live in Santa Monica, there are certain days I don't want to go more than 10 miles of my base because I may have something else going on or pick up the kids from school or whatever. Yeah. Well, once you send me to Timbuktu, the question is, how am I going to get back, yeah. right? So we don't know where you're going. I mean, a lot of passengers, I don't think are even... Are, are, are even aware of the situation. So right. once I'm out of that core or, or where rides are really not that plentiful, well, most likely I'm going to deadhead it back. And when you deadhead, obviously you're putting miles on your car and you have to figure out the costs. Yeah. So to me, 
we are not independent contractors. We definitely are not. And you quoted in your in the article that I read today a lot from Alex Rosenblatt about her book Uberland. I read the book. I think it's a fantastic book. And she has a quote in there when she, where she says, you know, which 14 of the 24 hours you're going to decide to work, you know, <laughs> makes Uber's argument of flexibility and, uh, uh, you know, and freedom is, is, is moot, basically, because if I'm getting paid less than minimum wage, who cares where I'm driving, when I'm driving, if I can decide to turn the app on or off? I'm sure you read about it last I wrote about it on the rideshare guy um, last month. Lyft instituted a policy in New York after the TLC commission passed minimum wage rules and capping the driver headcount. Uh-huh. Well, now uh, they just Uber just joined them today, actually, day before you actually today. Yeah, um, that unless you have a 90% acceptance rate and had done 100 rides in the last 30 days, they won't even allow you to turn your app on. Wow. Yeah. That started a month ago with Lyft and now with this. Now, and that's without an AB5 in New York. Now, what are they going to do here? I have no idea, right? So they're retaliating. I mean, I think they're just circling the wagons and they're doing everything that they can. And that's on top of the last two weeks. Um, Lyft has cut rates in 12 major cities to 33 to 40 cents a mile. Yeah. I mean, look, I understand not everybody has the 58 cent deduction going for themselves. Maybe your car is a beater, which it should be if you're going to do Uber and Lyft these days, that your costs are maybe 20, 25 cents a mile. Still, I mean, how many pennies can you put together to to make some money about this? Now, I complain. I'm a driver's advocate. Even now, with 60 cents a mile rates in Los Angeles, when I drive, I I average over $30 an hour gross. Um, But I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm autopilot, basically. So, But how many of drivers like me are out there? I mean, I don't think there are too many. And yeah. I've actually interviewed 40 Uber and Lyft drivers last month and wrote an article about it. Uh, on average, Lyft drivers are making 14 to 16 hour gross and Uber drivers are making 14 to 15 to 17 dollars per hour gross. Uh, that's gross. Yeah. Well, so, so much for independence, so much for freedom, so much for flexibility. And when right? you say gross, I mean, it's actually fairly important to be specific about it because uh, drivers might have expenses that, that people might not think about. Right. Uh, in term, not 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 only just maintenance, but health care, et cetera. I mean, I, I would think that the costs, you know, the, the, the un, unspoken costs pile on over time. Without a question. I mean, 90 percent of the drivers, one of the I, I had 10 questions. I'll send you the link of the article, but I had 10 questions to ask drivers. And one of the questions was, do you treat driving your driving as a small business? Because I do. I do spreadsheets every day. I know exactly what my costs are. That's besides what you mentioned as far as healthcare and all the other issues. But when you're driving a car, obviously, look, you have four or five major expenses, yeah. starting with gasoline, which most people only factor that in. But you have depreciation. You have wear and tear. You have maintenance. You have um, insurance. You have car payment. You have all these things that you have to factor in. And then you'll come up with a number that you know what it costs for you to operate your car per hour. So if you're making $15 an hour, in my case, with my car, it's about between $5.80 and $6 an hour. And assuming my car is an average car about four or five years old, which I do Uber and Lyft with, the one that I use for, well, most people's averages are going to be pretty similar to mine or probably higher if you're driving a newer car. So uh, to me, well, let's take that five or six dollars, let's take six dollars on average. If you're grossing 14 to 16 dollars an hour as a Lyft driver, and you take that five or six dollars out of it, you're left with what? With nothing, we're like eight or nine dollars net, right? Which is well below the the minimum wage in in Los Angeles, right? Well below, yeah, but not only that, but to my surprise, 90% 90% of the drivers said, no, we, we just get out and drive. So they don't run it like a small business. And Uber and Lyft knows this. Look, Uber and Lyft know exactly what they're doing. I mean, they didn't become multi-billion dollar companies because they're stupid, right? Now, the, how they're going at it, and then I'm a capitalist. I was on Wall Street. So all power to them. I'm not against that. But fairness has to come into play at some point. Yeah. 
and there is no driver education out there. There is nothing out there that, unless a few blogs or websites or YouTube channels that you can watch, and most people don't care about those things. Yes, there are some groups, Facebook groups or whatever. The ignorance of the driver is pretty much what Uber and Lyft want. I mean, initially, initially with an economics degree, right, I thought, okay, if I had a business and I had a turnover, Uber, Uber and Lyft have... 80 to 90 percent turnover in less than eight months. These are their numbers. I'm not telling this just out of my head, right? right. So if 80 to 90 percent quit, well, that's practically 100 percent of your workforce that you have to replace and retrain, right? and the cost of like just well, there is no there is no reach, there is no training, zero sure. training, right? right? But but basically, the training is you pass a watered down background check. If you're breathing, you're fine. Um, you know, you download the app and you go. Put your gas in your car and go. So to me, okay, if, if a business is, has a turnover of 80, 90 percent, that business is not going to have success. Yeah. Initially, that was my idea that, okay, well, these people are just not going to have success because of this. But you know what? They were the smartest people in the room, not me, yeah. because they like 80, 90 percent turnover. Yeah. Because, because the new drivers that they're getting don't have a point of reference. See, as a veteran, I have a lot of scars. Of course. Because of the rate cuts, right? Yeah. But for the new driver in Los Angeles, they cut the rates in this March to this to 2019 to 60 cents a mile from 80 cents a mile. That's an, that was another 30 or 25 percent cut. And they didn't call it a cut; they call it a rebalancing. Of course. And I'm going like, okay, you know, they have all these fancy words that they use that people don't understand. But then to me, it's like it's a cut because I ran a spreadsheet of all my rides for the day. I made 20 percent less. So I was like, okay, well, there's nothing in my knowledge bank that I can apply to make up for this 20% cut. There's nothing I can do. And at the same time, gas prices were going through the roof. I mean, the gas prices at that time were like three, now we're paying four. So to me, there's no way to get around it. But the new drivers that they're getting don't have a point of reference. To them, 60 cents a mile is gold. They don't even know. They don't understand. So, you know, Uber and Lyft know this very well, and then they just take advantage of it. I mean, they're just constantly replenishing drivers is something that I think worked for them really, really well by just selling the flexibility and the freedom argument. And somebody, so as an advocate, what are some of the stories that you've come across that kind of built, have built on your own experience, but kind of maybe are even more harrowing about people trying to survive, you know, and not being able to, uh, you know, the, the, and the kind of obstacles that, that drivers face that people might not think about? Well, a lot, I mean, we read all the stories in the mainstream media about people, you know, drivers sleeping in their cars, and uh, you know, look, these cuts are cuts. They can they can say whatever they want. Um, they may be able to sell it to certain drivers, but then, if I'm making, I mean, I have screenshots going back to the first day that I drove. My income has gone down from with everything I know, and I consider myself an elite driver. And it's gone from 45 to $50 an hour to if I can crack $30 an hour now, I'm a hero, right? Yeah. Well, that's valid for everybody. With Obviously, depending on what city you drive in, your cost of living expenses have gone through the roof over the last, I don't know, six, seven, eight years of Uber's existence. Yeah. So uh, there are a lot of stories out there that people just cannot survive, cannot buy food and can sleep in their cars. And, and in fact, they move cities because in one city, the demand is not there. I know a lot of stories that a lot of Sacramento drivers move down to San Francisco and sleep there. A lot of, you know, drivers in Texas move from their small towns to Houston and Dallas area because the demand is there. They just sleep in their cars. Look, these things, this is not Uber and Lyft's fault directly, but then the, the fare cuts, the price cuts, um, make sure that that these kind of things are happening and then i i speak to a lot of drivers when i drive i mean my my passion is just pulling over and when i see an uber and lyft driver i'll speak to them and then i'll ask them what their complaints are and number one complaint is 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 making money yeah and uh as long as this continues right you're going to hear the stories of people sleeping in their cars and not being able to pay or or lose their cars and and because look the number one issue for me is uber and lyft have oversaturated the marketplace to such a point now in especially major cities you know there's two factors in this there's two utilization rates right drivers are not maybe educated enough or smart enough to understand this but 
I don't fault them. Look, they, people got to make money. It is what it is. The gig economy is massive now. I mean, I'm pretty sure it's skewing a lot of the unemployment numbers that the federal government is throwing out there. Yeah. But there was a Forbes article that I read that 57 million people, I mean, the workforce of the U.S. is about 135, 40 million people. 57 million people of, are, are involved in the gig economy. All these companies start with a great promise, just like Uber and Lyft did. They pay well. You are making good money definitely double, if not more than minimum wage, you are working flexible hours, but then what happens? When they get to a certain scale, they start cutting. Well, this is valid with every gig economy company. I mean, you can do, go from DoorDash to Instacart to whatever you want to call it. And people are having a difficult time making money, making ends meet, doing the, the gig work, right? But I, I think the narrative is changing, though. I mean, you know, we're hearing nothing but stories out there of disasters, and to be honest with you, I do read a lot of social media, and and, and I do visit a bunch of forums. Um, I don't know if there has been two companies <laughs> more hated than Uber and Lyft, right? But then, on the other hand, people are still out there driving. Yeah. They, so what does that tell you? What does that tell you about the underlying strength of the American job market? That there's this kind of you know this endless pool of people who are willing to put in some fairly deep sacrifices to earn a fairly small wage. Well, it, I mean, what does it tell you? It tells you that uh, the American economy is not as strong as everybody says it is and uh, that we're right around the corner. We're going to go into a recession and the bubble they created in 2008 is just bigger now because they keep pumping money every day on us every, every single day. I mean, my opinion is my opinion, obviously, but um, I have an econ background. Um, look, I've learned very different things in my econ books when I was graduating. The, the whole system has changed. You know, people don't pay attention to profits anymore, and people are all, well, top-line growth, top-line growth. The American economy is not doing as well as everybody thinks it's doing, obviously. Or um, people have basically are, you know, are willing to sacrifice the freedom and the flexibility part of the gig economy, you know, they, they're getting that, but what are you giving up? Are they yeah. sitting down and having a talk with themselves? What am I giving up here by not being an employee? Yeah. Is my freedom and flexibility worth sacrificing this much? And I don't think that's been answered, but... And not um, only that, it's not, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I've come to learn from, from my colleagues who study the issue is that the flexibility argument is not only weak from that standpoint that you've just pointed out, but also because making people employees doesn't actually curtail uh, the the company's ability to allow for flexibility, right? Without a question. I mean, I read the whole law. I read AB5 page to page. There's nothing in there that says your flexibility and freedom will be lost, yeah. right? But... Um, I'm, look, Uber and Lyft have to do what they have to do. You know, they created this, nine, well, including DoorDash now, they created this $90 million fund uh, to take this to a referendum next year, next year's elections. I'm pretty sure they're going to lose that one as well, but it's just buying time, right? Yeah. And then they came up with that offer of $21 minimum, which is a lot of, you know what, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> just for the fact that within three seconds, I figured, well, it's a $21 book time. Well, book time means while you have a passenger in the car, but then you oversaturated the market so much that my utilization rate that was 80% could have been 100% three years ago. Now it's down to, if I'm lucky, it's down to 50% in a city like Los Angeles, right? In most other cities, it's probably worse. Yeah. So why did Uber and Lyft, you know, oversaturate the marketplace? Because their utilization rate is completely different than my utilization rate. My utilization rate <coughs> is how many minutes of the, of the hour I have a passenger in my car. Yeah. And your utilization rate is how fast can this passenger get picked up, right? Pick up ETAs, have to go down. That's, that's one of the things that they wanted to do. And they oversaturated the market to, to a point that ETAs have gone down to like three to five minutes max now in Los Angeles for the passenger. But then utilization rate for the driver has gone down from 80, 90% to 50% if they're lucky, right? Yeah. So not only the price cuts have happened, but, you know, they're also one of their, you know, talking points was, well, we're cutting fares, we're cutting rates so that you'll be busier and you'll make more money. Well, yeah, that would be perfectly good if you capped the driver count at the same level. Now, if you oversaturated the market 100% and my utilization rate went from 80 to 50% and you cut the rates on top of that, 
how am I going to make more money? So basically what happens is I drive twice the amount of hours to make the same amount of money. Well, that doesn't fly in, in, in my econ book, but then you know, I guess it flies in their book. And so this, this flexibility and freedom argument is a is lot of nothing but crap. But then here, look, AB5 is here. They have to deal with it. So that's my next question. How do you think it's going to affect the landscape, both for even for drivers, but even for for sectors beyond? Well, I think it's going to. I mean, it's going it, to. It, well, once it becomes law, January first of two thousand twenty. Um, well, as you know, a lot of um, professions got an exemption through AB five, right? Yeah. Uh, so, but to me, it almost seems like this was directly for the gig economy companies. Yeah. Um, obviously, truckers lost a little bit in this. I, from what I read last few days, independent truckers did. But uh, most professions got exemptions. Um, you know, I mean, look, states know this. I understand they're looking out for the driver. They're selling it this way. But also, they're losing a lot of revenue. I mean, 57 million people in the gig economy is a lot of people. Yeah. So they're losing revenue. So if California did this, things will change. How they will change, uh, if, if Uber and Lyft are going to react the way they're reacting in New York now, because when I drive, I'm very selective driver. So in my case, I'm definitely going to get hurt, but I'm taking one for the team. Yeah. Um, so my thing is I have other sources of revenue, so it's not my livelihood. But then uh, for people who it is their livelihood, it's not just completely a side gig because 20% of the drivers are full-time, yeah. do 80% of the rides, and 80% of the drivers who are part-time do 20% of the rides. Well, there is 20 or 20% of the drivers are going to benefit from this just because, okay, um, they may have a minimum wage restored. 80%, some of the 80% part-timers will probably be let go by what Uber and Lyft is doing in New York now by not allowing them to go online and make some money, you know. But if you're driving for 10 hours out there to make an extra 100 bucks a, a week, you know, I, I don't even think you should be out there, to yeah. be honest with you. Yeah. So, yeah, things will change. And it's it's basically not a dance. Now it's a legal dance, and let's see how it's going to go. Uh, will it change for the better? Uh, look, with my experience over the last seven years with Uber and Lyft, nothing has been done that's been beneficial to the driver. And I can unequivocally say that nothing has been done. It's been price cuts. It's been It's been cuts all over the place. And... At some point, they needed a break check, right? So this is their break check. So let's see what happens. Fascinating. Well, thank you so much, Sergio. This is great. I really appreciate it. Is there anything I didn't ask about that you wanted to, to flag? No, not really. I mean, my, my thing is, 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 is as far as the driver is concerned, if the driver can get together, like, you know, as you know, we, we had a couple of protests and so-called strikes or whatever, right? Yes. And in Chicago now, the, the city attorney is trying to get the Uber and Lyft uh, names from Uber and Lyft as a, as a list. Yeah. And Uber and Lyft took them to the court and said, no, the, the, they said, uh, the drivers are trade secrets. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I was like, yeah, I'm honored I'm a trade secret. And I'm surprised and they didn't cite pri drivers' privacy concerns somehow. Uh, yeah, they didn't say that. They're just they're always in for their own. So yeah, they yeah. said they're trade secrets. Amazing. And then what they said is, uh, we're afraid that the competitor, they never named Lyft, by the way, but they said the competitor may be able to poach our drivers. Now, I don't know about poaching because um, uh, Mr. Uber and Lyft, if you know, 80% quit in less than eight months. So there's not much to poach. <laughs> right, exactly. And plus, the two, if the two platforms are allowed to coexist, like it's not like it's they're exclusive. So, Yeah, exactly. So most drivers that I know of or I, rec I coach, um, you know, I, the first thing I tell them, look, you have to be on both platforms. Yeah. You can't just be on Uber. You can just be on Lyft, right? And so most drivers are on both platforms anyway. Yep. But um, it's going to be a fight. It's, I mean, look, they're... I think $90 million that they put out there for this referendum is like a hedge to protect maybe like a $80, $90 billion market cap yeah. that they're supporting right now. So it's a pretty good hedge, right? I would have done the same thing. Yeah. But I see over the last six to eight months, a lot has changed, right? There is so much. I mean, they're getting bombarded from every angle now. Yeah. And there is so much negativity out there that 
they have to relent, I'm saying, but then knowing Uber and Lyft, you know, they play hardball. I don't, I, they're, they're trying to protect their existence, for God's sakes, right? I mean, yeah. they have to do what they have to do. Yeah. Well, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time. And uh, if I, if you don't mind my asking, what did you used to trade on Wall Street? I actually, I used to be a Wall Street reporter. So I used to work for, oh, Reuter, for um, Reuters initially? covering the markets. So, so. Oh, after after school, I, I went to New York for six months. I was trained, uh, to be honest with you, initially I started with commodities. Uh-huh. And I used to trade gold uh, and the now, you know, gone the old World Trade Center, uh-huh. the, oh, the yeah. Twin Towers, the oh, Twin yeah. wow. Towers, and we used to go to Windows of the World up top there. Sure, yeah, trade. I've been up there. Ah, uh, yeah, I mean, no, that probably was the worst ever of time of my life, to be honest with you. When yeah. those things went down, yeah. I was like, I, I probably cried for like 10 days straight. Oh, I mean, it, was rough, myself. Yeah. it was rough. And uh, so I started there. Then, uh, as you know, that's a pretty intense kind of a <laughs> environment. And then... Um, I switched to equities about a year and a half after that, and uh, NAS- I was, you know, the old days, as you know, we had the courts and quarters and eighths, right? Yeah. Before decimalization that's right, started, yeah. but that's how far back I they go. They still do it. And, well, I, I, I actually was a bond market reporter, so they, we still work with fractions in that market. Yeah, yeah, you still do with the 64th <laughs> and 30 seconds, right? So I was, uh, I switched to equities, and then I moved my way up, and I was the Prudential head of NASDAQ trading for about eight years, for the last eight years. Very nice. And uh, I didn't start at Prudential. I started with a small boutique firm called Beige Halsey Stewart Shields, and then Prudential ended up buying them, and we became a subsidiary of Prudential Insurance of America. And uh, so it was pretty much NASDAQ equities, where we were obviously market makers, and we were a profit center, so we would do what we need to do. Uh, it was fun. I learned a lot. It was It was fun. And nowadays... You know, uh, the way I trade is in a much smaller degree. Use high-frequency trading or computerized algorithmic trading, really. I have a couple of my own algorithms that I just throw in there and try to make some money here and there. Um, So, yeah, I mean, I'm still involved. I still follow. And then I'm short um, Lyft. I'm not short Uber yet, but I'm short Lyft. I've been short Lyft since 72. So I'm going to stay short until that thing goes to (laughs) $2.62. <laughs> uh, that's what that's what they pay their drivers for a minimum fare. So I will cover it two sixty two. I love it. I love it. I like that. I like that as a price marker. That's a good one. Well, there you go. That's my, and and that's not to go long. That's just to cover my short. That's great. <laughs> well, great. This is great, man. Thank you so much for your time, and I'm sure I'd like to stay in touch because we'll have a lot to talk about. So because I also pay to, even though I'm here at EPI, I've been at this think tank for nine months now, but. My whole life, I've been basically a financial reporter covering the Fed and covering markets. So I still pay, I still watch Powell's press conference and watch the markets pretty closely. So, yeah, I mean, look, you know, it's a fascinating thing, right? The, one of the reasons I got attracted to that was because it's not static, right? I'm not a nine to five kind of guy. Exactly. Everything changes every second. And, and I, you know, it, it fit me. And then it fit my personalities. You know, when I went through my um, psychological exams before I got hired, uh, you know, they put us through two psychological exams to see if I'm cut for this kind of a job. Yeah. And um, yeah, I know, I mean, I remember like yesterday, you know, I got a call from the day I got hired. I wasn't even home. I was at my girlfriend's house. The guy that hired me called me up. He goes, I have good news and bad news. He goes, which one do you want? I go, I don't know, <laughs> whatever you want. And then he says, he goes, you're insane. And I go, oh, really? <laughs> I go, that's horrible. He goes, no, no, that's exactly what we're looking for. Yeah. <laughs> that's like, oh, classic. Okay, thank you. That's cla- that was classic. I never forget that. That's classic oh, Wall Street, yeah. right? Like, we want the... <laughs> oh, yeah. We I want your like, madness. I, oh, yeah, I was type quadruple A, quintuple A, forget the triple A. That's, and, uh, you I know, it. I know I have literally sat on people's throats for like a quarter of a point, so... <laughs> <laughs> I, it was me, but now I'm like father of two and trying to raise a couple of good kids. That's about it. Now I'm down to like a single A, I think, from quadruple A. Hey man, it's all it's it's all the better for your heart, if not for your wallet. Yeah, I mean, it's all good. You know, it's all good. But that's, yeah, let's keep in great. touch. And then, uh, I mean, I know enough about it that I don't care about it. But yeah. then, when I say I don't care, I know more than I, I I need to know. But then, in my life, I've never done anything, you know, halfway. 
And if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do something properly. So yeah. this was this was the way. And now I write quite a bit, and I do these interviews, and I do podcasts, and you know, my voice is getting at home now, so which is That's good. Great. And uh, it's fun. It's been fun, That's and awesome. and it's gonna the saga continues. Let's see how it goes. Absolutely. That's great. Well, thank you so much. It's my pleasure today to be joined by Larry Michel. Larry is a distinguished fellow at EPI and one of its founding fathers, as I like to call him. And uh, we're here to talk about a really important and timely issue today, which is the so-called gig economy. Uh, and I say so-called because I want to start, you know, really honing in on that terminology. There's a lot of... Uh, a lot of euphemisms that seem to get thrown around in the tech world, like sharing economy, gig economy. Could you break down the terminology, uh, since you've studied the issue in depth, what do you consider gig work and, and, and what is something else? That's a great place to start, Pedro, and thanks for having me on. Uh, you know, people, uh, basically the media, when they put in headlines, use gig for a wide variety of types of employment. So let's start at the broadest category, which I would call... Uh, contingent work. This is um, made up of a, of a number of types of work. It includes people who work temporarily, uh, uh, either directly for a firm or through a, a staffing service. Uh, it could involve people who are self-employed. It could be on-call workers. Uh, it could be workers who work um, in firms that contract with other firms, but they are actually working for a firm that has a number of employees. So they're, you know, they work as a, for a contractor who runs a warehouse for Amazon or such like that. So that broader category of contingent uh, is, is an important one. And uh, like um, other categories, it has it uh, expanded in some places and not in others. So, um, you know, we haven't seen that much of a rise over the last 40 years in, let's say, franchising or uh, or temporary help, it's going up uh, about a percent or two of the workforce. Self-employment, we'll talk about later, but that's really been pretty stable. The part of contingent work that I think is of concern and should be the topic of another episode uh, is the fissured workplace. And that is where firms are contracting out to uh, other firms to shift costs, to shift liabilities, to try to lower wages. So when you walk into a Marriott, the people behind the desk may be working for a contractor. They don't actually work for Marriott. The people who clean work for a different contractor, et cetera. So it's a, it's a legal maneuver to put workers uh, at a disadvantage. Um, but the category that frequently gets talked about uh, is the overall one of self-employment or freelancers. And we've seen a lot of contention uh, that we're all going to become freelancers, that you know pretty soon... In 10 years, 20% of the workforce, 30% of the workforce is uh, going to be people working for themselves. Temp nation, I believe, the phenomenon. is. Temp nation, called. freelance nation, yeah. right. Uh, back in the late 1990s, a book on that. And it's, it's, it, it's um, total baloney uh, and has been for a long time. Um, the fact is that um, people who say that then claim the, uh, the fundamental nature of work is changing. In fact... Uh, the number of people that are freelancers has risen a little bit. The number of people who are freelancers that do it as their main job has been stable for since the mid-1990s. So one of the things that many recent research papers have concluded is that uh, 1099s are not replacing W-2 work, right? There may be a lot more people doing uh, some freelancing, but they tend to do it for supplementary income on top of their W-2 work uh, and not as their main job. So the, the fundamental nature of work in that regard has not changed. Uh, there has been, and this is the topic that brings us here today, that the growth of freelancing uh, in the last few years has really only been um, by what I think you could reasonably call gig work, or it's better to be called online platform work. That is, work that is mediated through an app or a platform where you get paid through the app. And that has, that has grown, in terms of the number of people, quite a lot. In terms of a share of the workforce, it may be one, one and a half, two percent. But that's a lot compared to 
zero percent back in 2012, right? And we're talking about Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, Dash, DoorDash, all these kinds exactly. of services. Well, it, it, it's interesting to note that the increase in the on-demand on demand platform work is primarily in transportation. It is really Lyft and Uber. More recently, the DoorDashes, uh, et cetera. So um, wh what do we know about those workers? Well, we know that Uber workers and Lyft workers, uh, the vast majority of them are working to supplement income. Uh, the average Uber driver, uh, his or her career with Uber lasts three months. Uh, around 65% of Uber drivers quit within six months. Uh, they drive on average 17 hours uh, a week. So um, there's a very high churn. There's a lot of people who are working very part-time and to supplement their income. At the same time, we need to be cognizant that there are a lot of full-time Uber drivers who are doing this as their main thing. And, um, and they play an important role for Uber. So it's been estimated that around half the rides provided are provided by full-time workers, and the other half are provided by this churn of part-time supplementary workers. Now, that's also true of all the other kinds of um, on-demand uh, work as well. It turns out that it's mostly people who are doing it for supplemental income, even more so than Uber and Lyft. Let me ask you a quick follow-up before you go sure. on, before we get to Uber, on, because you mentioned contingent work as opposed to gig work. Contingent, to me, uh, just sounds like something that's not certain. It sounds uh, contingent. It sounds uh, temp. It sounds contract. How big is contingent work versus gig economy work? And is and and where do you think the impression comes from that we are becoming a temptation if if the data suggests otherwise? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I, I can't say that we have a really good handle on uh, the biggest piece of the contingent work, which is the the fissured workplace, the the layering of contract and individual contract independent contractors reporting to firms, uh, and that uh, research is ongoing. But that could be, I don't know, ten twenty percent at, at I think at most. Um, the parts that are been fairly stable are people who are working in actual temp jobs for a, 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 a staffing supply firm or temporarily directly for a firm. Um, so that's, that's been a phenomenon that we've been studying uh, in, at EPI and in labor economics uh, you know, for, uh, for almost 30 years now. Um, and the, the fissured part is a problem. The, the reason why there's, that's a good question I should ask you as a former journalist, you know, why has there been so much of a focus on, on the gig economy? And I think uh, there's a number of reasons. I would just speculate. It's not economics, but just as an observer. One is because there's a lot of people just want to pay attention to the tech economy. There's a big megaphone in front of them. There's a lot of media. There's a lot of clicks. Anytime you put something out about the gig economy, uh, the tech uh, barons uh, view themselves as the center of the universe. So when they think, see things going on, they think they are creating the world. And it's not just that. So I think there's a there's a liberal elite, uh, coastal elite bias in the media in, in that very narrow sense. So, you know, reporters are most likely to be in cities where they take Uber and Lyft all day long. And so yeah. they think of it as some revolution, some something that's really changed their lives. And yet, you know, if you go to other parts of the country, it's much less prevalent, of course. It's sort of the same phenomenon as that we've we've discovered within EPI that you know reporters tend to write about themselves, right? People think about themselves. So if reporters are predominantly white and male, they will write white and male stories. Uh, we 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 found out that when we released reports on the uh, job prospects for high school graduates, nobody covers it. When we released, even though you know they are a bigger part of the economy than than college graduates, and so. Uh, so that's, there's a sort of, in here, that's, that's sort of how I well, see the bias. Well, I can even tell you uh, even more. Someone had been talking about these things since the mid-1980s. So when in the mid-1980s, when blue-collar workers were experiencing plant closures and manufacturing was not doing so well, then it was hard to get a hearing about these issues. But in the mid-90s, when downsizing was happening and journalism was starting to have uh, problems, then reporters really uh, got, got what was going on. And, and they really do get it now because with private equity and everything invading and abusing them. 
But yeah, so, um, you know, there's been a lot of uh, contention about, um, you know, the gig economy being everything. I think that the bubble was burst uh, last year when the Bureau of Labor Statistics came out with the gold standard of the data, which showed that independent contractors, which includes all the on-platform gig workers, uh, was just about 7%, 7 percent, 7.5% of employment. And it was the same as in 2005 and the same as in... Um, 1995. I and remember that report because there was so much hype in newsrooms at the time, like, oh, we're, this is going to be a big spike. And, this is gonna be, and they thought BLS was wrong. Had yes. to, BLS had to be wrong. So then the, then the narrative became, um, you know, why is BLS wrong? And because BLS is only looking at people on their main job. Well, the point is, if you want to make a statement about the future of work, the future of work has to be about how people are earning a living, right? People don't have a lot of bonds they're living, you know, and, and stock they're living off of, right? They, people can make a living from what they earn on the job. And so if your earning on the job is is not increasingly coming from self-employment, then that's not the future of work. Yeah. So I don't think the future of work is about freelancing or self-employment. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't issues being raised appropriately about helping people who are freelancers. In New York, there's a bill to make sure that freelancers get paid. There's other uh, work making sure that they get access to portable benefits, uh, meaning that they find some way to get unemployment insurance or vacation or sick leave or or health and pension. Um, but one of the problems with uh, helping the self-employed and providing uh, these things like portable benefits is that to do so also helps all those firms like Uber that misclassifies their workers and makes them into independent contractors when they are really employees. So it's really important that if we, as we do things to provide a safety net for the uh, freelancers, that we couple it with a very aggressive uh, policy set that will keep people from being misclassified. Now, why does that Can matter? Can you explain that concept a little yeah. bit to people? What is worker misclassification and how does it affect the economy negatively and, and how does it cost yeah, workers that's ultimately. a great that's a great point so when you most people who are employees well people who are employees get a w-2 at the end of the year that's how you know you're really an employee uh and if you don't then you may think you're an employee but you're not um firms uh increasingly like to consider people independent contractors give them 1099s rather than w-2s because they don't have to provide them benefits that they might provide to their other employees. They don't have to pay the employer side of the Social Security Medicare tax. They don't have to provide um, uh, unemployment insurance payroll taxes. They don't have to provide worker comp. Um, and something like worker comp is a very important thing for people who are basically taxi drivers. It's equivalent of around $2 an hour to Uber if they were to pay worker comp for their drivers. And that's because driving is a very dangerous business. If you look at how much people who are W-2 workers for taxis, um, that's how much the taxi companies end up paying. So, uh, and, and then up the, the, the governments, both the state and the um, federal government, local governments, usually end up not getting as much taxes when people are independent contractors because, you know, people's wages aren't withheld and paid and, and, and people tend to escape. So, uh, oh, and the last thing, I mean, uh, is also that independent contractors are not covered by our laws re regarding collective bargaining or sex, uh, race, age, disability, uh, discrimination. So you have no recourse if you're discriminated against. You have no recourse to, to form a union if you're an independent contractor. And in this case, we're not talking about just you know what we think we talk, we're talking across industries here right it's not just drivers and so on this is it's a huge getting... problem in places like construction where again you know uh, employers would very much like not to have to pay benefits or or worker comp it's a huge issue in trucking uh there's been you know we there's been very famous uh, articles about the port drivers in LA and them being forced to be independent contractors and it's true of in my view uh you know lift drivers and Uber drivers, and that's roughly 2 million people uh, or more uh, in a year. So it's actually, in my view, uh, an amazing feat that all these companies like Federal Express, Uber, Lyft, can go on misclassifying their workers. 
And you have to ask yourself, well, why is it that all the government agencies that are involved don't aren't able to clamp down on them? Because the uh, the worker comp system is not getting money. The unemployment insurance is not getting money. The state tax system, the federal tax system, uh, the National Labor Relations Act, the wage and hour people who, who enforce overtime and minimum wage are, are, are not really active. And they do that by, uh, in a sense... Uh, lobbying. And this is not just a Trumpian starve the beast phenomenon. No, this, this is, is a longstanding yeah. issue. So take Federal Express. Um, you know, they, uh, UPS has its people. They, they're all W-2 employees. FedEx gets away with all sorts of variations of uh, claiming their people are independent contractors. And they they end up losing suits, paying hundreds of millions of dollars. But then instead of making their people employees, they make them self-employed, independent contractors in a new way. So the suits have to start all over again and indict them, you know, uh, go to a court and get that changed. But let's let's just talk about Uber a little bit because I think that's what's on people's mind, Uber yes, and please. Lyft. And, you know, without getting into the legalities, well, I mean, one of the problems is, and we'll talk about the, uh, the new legislation in California, is that a lot of the um, ways of judging who's a... A W-2 worker and who's an independent contractor can be kind of fuzzy um, or too fuzzy. But, um, but let's just, uh, let me appeal to people's common sense. Um, is Don't ask whether Uber driver is a W-2 worker. Ask, are they really running their own business? You know, can you see? So let's just say, as a business person, well, they can are, set their own hours. That that would be the Uber yeah, argument, right? Well, the Uber argument is they they can decide when and where to work, and they can also decide to work for Uber or work for Lyft or start something else. So they must be self employed. But the the bottom line is that the only way for an Uber driver to increase his or her earnings is to drive more hours. They have no control over their business. So, for instance, uh, the prices are all determined by Uber. Uber in fact, over the years, just lowers the prices. They even changed the whole way that pricing works if they feel like it. They moved from a system where they paid people based on the time of the ride and the length and miles of the ride to they just tell the, um, the, you know, the rider an upfront price, and then the, um, the driver gets paid in a totally different way. So they have uh, total control over the, um, over the prices. Um, they can't build a base. The the Uber driver, if you like your Uber driver, you cannot identify his or her name and request the Uber driver. So even if you do a good job, it's not like they can build up a customer base. They are not allowed to uh, keep the contact information of the people that they, uh, you know, give rides to. Because you can't order a particular Uber driver, they can't advertise. They can't go on the street and give out leaflets saying, I want to be your Uber driver. Um, they are not allowed to subcontract. So if they had more business than they wanted, they could they can handle. It's not like they can give it to their friend and say, um, you know, Susie will give you the ride. You know, that's not allowed. Uh, so they, they really can't, um, you know, improve their business whatsoever. How much can they improve their business by being better at their job? Uh, there's a, a very good academic paper that looked at the return to experience of an Uber driver. And if you discount the first 150 rides where they're basically learning about how to do it, after that, over the next two years, their earnings per hour rise around 9%. Well, that's not inflation adjusted. And if you look at what happens to other workers in the economy, they all saw their earnings rise by around 8%. So for an entrepreneur, they really can't build their business. And then after the first two years, their earnings really don't rise. They, they flatten out. So these are people who are controlled by Uber. Uh, they are told uh, how to drive. The, the route by Uber, if they vary from that, Uber can dock them. Um, they uh, really can't improve their earnings except uh, deciding to drive at a different time, uh, which doesn't really help so much because you can only make money if there's people on the road asking for rides you know it's not it's it you know the, it, you have the freedom to earn hardly anything by choosing to drive you know in the middle of the day mm -hmm. or in the in the middle of the night so uh what we also know 
based on uh, research that uh, I've done for the Economic Policy Institute, that Uber drivers earn a minimum wage or below, 9 or $10 an hour in terms of wages. And for people who live and drive in major cities, the minimum wage is much higher than that in most of the major cities. So that's a pretty strange kind of entrepreneur uh, who uh, you know earns a minimum wage and Uber itself in its filing to, be, to sell stock for the first time called its IPO likened its drivers to people who work in retail and restaurants, which are some of the lowest paying industries. So that's a very strange thing to say. These people are entrepreneurs, small business people. You know, we consider them low wage workers and we basically control them. Um, and that gets us to AB5. Indeed. So let's, let's talk about California, recent passage of legislation that, uh, if I understand it correctly, pushes to recognize, uh, you know, gig economy workers as actual employees of these firms. So what are the implications in, uh, both for yeah. California, for Uber, and for for this kind of work nationally? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's a really uh, exciting development. Uh, the, the California Supreme Court uh, last year in a decision called Dynamex uh, established a new criteria for deciding who was going to be considered a, an employee versus an independent contractor. It's a three-part test. Uh, I won't go into all the details, but the, but the point is it really clarifies it. And if you are doing the main business of the firm, uh, you're going to be considered a, an employee. Uh, and what happened is that the state legislature decided that uh, they were going to codify, put the Dynamex decision into legislation. And uh, that was a, a, a big legislative battle. Uh, Uber, Lyft, Handy, other uh, firms really uh, opposed it. They tried to mobilize their drivers and their, their workers against it. They, they didn't succeed. It passed uh, overwhelmingly, and it's expected that the governor will sign it soon, and it'll take effect in January. And what that does is it'll, it'll make um, most people in the on-demand platform economy uh, into uh, regular workers. And importantly, they gave the right of uh, the attorney generals uh, or district attorneys or whatever in the big cities to enforce it along with the California attorney general. So uh, this is important because Uber and Lyft are, are big bullies. You know, we know that over uh, the years, they've gone into cities where they acted illegally and their, um, you know, their, their modus operandi was, um, you know, don't don't abide by the law. You know, we'll apod apologize later if we have to. And, and what they uh, Uber said pay the, if pay the fine, pay the fine, or, or whatever, or threaten to leave, like they did in Austin, Texas, and they did. Uh, but they, um, what Uber said after this legislation um, passed is they said, "Well, okay, go ahead. We'll see you in court." So they're really being bullies. Um, they're claiming that they're a um, just a technology platform not really a transportation business, which many a judge has um, giggled at when they made that uh, claim. So what's really important is that this is the first time that we're really seeing a successful pushback against um, misclassification. And it's not just, you know, Uber and Lyft drivers, though that's important. It's going to be people in construction. Uh, it's going to be janitors. It's going to be uh, others uh, as well. And we expect that to be... Um, followed up in other places. Uh, New York was jealous. They said, you know, we don't want California to get the reputation of the progressive state. We're going to do it. And uh, there's national legislation being introduced. And many of the uh, presidential candidates among the Democrats have already announced that they favor a basically a national AB5 legislation. And that's 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 very exciting. And, um, you know, one of the first the, the, one of the biggest things in employment law in decades. I want to ask you the Silicon Valley question, which is, you know, they, they, you know, they do claim that they're tech firms and there is a technology component to it. Uh, what about innovation? What about making things better? I have to say, as a as a uh, as somebody who takes DC cabs, the quality of DC cabs has improved because they've had to compete with the albeit utterly unregulated uh, competitors uh, like Lyft yeah. and and, uh, and Uber. So, I, I, aren't you stifling innovation by uh, by 
preventing these companies from coming about or from, yeah. from doing business in this way? Well, uh, I guess we'll see. Um, I, I do think that that what Uber and Lyft provide is is a really good service that that people want and need, and the taxi industry is not one that we should shelter, uh, and they should have to compete or or, or die. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, they have to uh, they have to show that they can provide a living wage and provide good services, and if they can't do both then they won't prevail and live. And, and we don't really know uh, a path by which uh, Uber and Lyft are going to attain profitability. Uh, and they, they, they worry about having to pay a living wage. But I don't see why we should allow um, workers to be exploited to uh, earn subpar uh, earnings, uh, not have worker comp, not have unemployment insurance as a way of subsidizing innovation. Innovation, if it's good, uh, it's going to exist if uh, while paying uh, decent living wages. No, oh, that makes sense. Uh, my last question is uh, basically about the future of this debate and where it heads, uh, both nationally and, and internationally. I know Uber's had a ton of problems in this area. Uh, and really what we've seen is after a long decline of labor and, and worker power that we've chronicled at EPI and, and, and researched and kind of written about its its negative consequences for inequality and wages we're actually seeing not just mobilization at the at the union level you know there's a, a strike going on at uh with uaw and, and, and general GM. motors uh we've seen teacher strikes across the country we're also seeing non-union entities mobilized such as uber and lyft drivers uh you know google workers google workers wayfair and, workers indeed so can you talk about the the kind of positive momentum that labor has in how it, it plays into an election year and really the, the, the future of, of economic debate in this country. Well, the big picture is that over the last 40 years, very conscious policy decisions and political things, uh, political actions by corporations and the wealthy have lowered the, the leverage of workers in dealing with their employers, keeping unemployment too high, uh, making it hard to have a union, doing things like misclassification, stealing their money through through wage theft, uh, and all of these different things. And there's now a concerted effort to reverse all this. Uh, we see it in, in, the, in the large policy proposals uh, floating in the Senate and the House by presidential candidates. We see it in the actions of the teachers uh, and um, uh, supermarket workers in California, GM workers. Uh, people are sticking up for themselves uh, and... You know, the, the situation is like a tinderbox. I think if, if people see ways that they can succeed collectively or, or politically to make their lives better, then they're going to they're gonna get it. They're, they're, you know, so there's going to light a fire. And with the tinder, I expect to see a lot of activity, just like we did with the teachers. It was just remarkable how uh, teachers really went out on strike in many ways that were illegal. But with the support of the parents, with the support of the school districts in deep red states, because um, both the schools had been sabotaged in terms of their spending, the teachers had been sabotaged in terms of what they could earn, and people were rallying around them. And I think we see uh, the largest uh, share of workers now indicate in polls that they would like to seek collective bargaining in their workplace tomorrow. Roughly half of the non union workforce wants a union on their job if they could have one. If we did, if they all could have a union, we would have uh, collective bargaining rates uh, higher than in Germany. So uh, it's not because people don't want collective action. They don't want unions. They don't want to work together. It's that they have been blocked from uh, being able to pursue that. Thank you so much. That was Larry Michelle, Distinguished Fellow at the Economic Policy Institute. I'm your host, Pedro da Costa. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you like the podcast. Please, please subscribe to EPI's YouTube channel and like us on YouTube, and you can download us wherever you get your podcasts.